Thank they you. are good. Yes. And You're very good. Good. Good morning, good morning, good morning to everybody who is watching us on. Good morning. Yes, also Facebook and LinkedIn. We are very happy to uh, once again introduce to you our one and only. She's not only ours, but she's the one and only Binati Shet. And Binati, thank you so very much for once again being on our show. We just uh, shared with you, with Tim and I, we shared with you a love message. To you right so yeah. how much we love that you're back and yes. how much yes we're looking forward to actually talking about japanese books so to everybody who hasn't met binati yet please go to linkedin and reach out to her uh she has amazing short videos introducing uh, her content like, is awesome yeah oh, i love so following binati yes. that warms my heart you know i got feedback that you should do more entertaining stuff and i'm like I am not entertaining. I like to stick to my niche and then that's it. <laughs> no, I think you are entertaining though. I, I really yeah. like your flavor. You, you you keep things moving fast, but you always have very, what, yeah. well thought out concepts yeah. and ideas that, yeah. I don't know how old you are, but I know I'm old enough to be 31. your dad. I'm 31. Okay. When I was 31, I was such a dumbass. I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't even close to you in the development of, how I looked at things. So I'm always very impressed. Like, oh man, the youngsters are okay. It makes me I, feel I good. I absolutely agree with you in how like even the newer generation that's coming after us, they're so sorted. Like they don't take anybody's uh, thing uh, at all. And you know, on one hand we could criticize it, but on the other, it's brilliant that they know how to define boundaries at such young ages. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Makes me hopeful. So thank you for that. You're like a kind of a ray of sunshine. And, and when I read your stuff, I always feel good. So oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. And, right. Time yes. for our sponsors. We got to get that out of the way, but we love them. So we want to do this. We want to do this. It's not an obligation. It always feels like um, a word of thank you. Really. Yes. From the so thanks a lot. Once again, a big shout out to our first sponsor, Kanachu.com and also james uh, howell so thank you very much Jay. thank you very much kanachu for being our sponsors for you uh, for watching us and you're hearing uh, their name for the first time kanachu offers bilingual services uh, to individuals who want to buy property who want to sell real estate in tokyo and yokohama so the company also does uh, property management and investment property. So if you want to work with them, reach out to James at james at canacho.com because uh, James is there to help you realize your project. You can speak with him in either Japanese or in English and you, yes, you should be sure that uh, your needs will be met with a lot of care. Yes. Yeah. They're the best. Yeah. All so, right. And without, so that's it, right? Without further ado, we got the sponsors. And yes. I think we're ready for Banati to uh, educate and entertain us. Edutain us. I, educate I, us. Educate us first. Yes. I don't know about entertain. Okay. Because when it comes to books, the number of tangents I go on is incredible. So, comment section, be, feel free to. Call me out whenever you're like, please come to the topic, lady, that type of thing. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> my hosts are used to it, but yours might not be. So uh, I, I think based on like a little bit of a conversation that we had going before the live link, Tim, what does, what do we learn from books about the culture, so to speak? Mm. So I particularly gravitated if I were to talk about just my experience as a reader I particularly gravitated towards Japanese books because of uh, largely speaking six things the first thing that stuck out to me was the books were very very minimalistic and they're very very direct so oh. if you get your hand on one of these books you can read them in one sitting like the directness of it all is not uh i suppose something that gets in the way of cognition it doesn't lead to a lot of confusion and it leaves so much room for your brain to short it later on 
when you think about what you just read so one thing that i really appreciated about japanese literature back in the day when i was encountering it for the first time was how minimalist it is and how direct it is and um, i i think it contributed to the number of books i picked up you know what i mean like if you are starting with 600 pages that take you 2 3 days or a week to finish you are like i have to read it let me go back the barrier to entry is a bit more comprehensive and i didn't have that happen for japanese literature it was mm-hmm. great because you are getting such wonderful stories sometimes stories that don't have a conventional storytelling structure but you still understand what is being talked about 100% so mm-hmm. i think that was brilliant i like the direct quote that you made because you know those of us who work with J- japanese culture there's also an indirectness built, baked into the culture to keep the harmony although the, even that's a myth because if you're in an inner circle with japanese family and friends they're extremely direct okay but outside yeah. of that context they're very indirect so when you tell me storytelling is indirect i i wonder maybe that's one outlet with, that allows them and gives them permission to be direct in their communication approach because they can't do it all day when they maybe when they want to but they can't you know i don't know just an observation does that make sense it makes perfect sense because when i was reading the short stories and maybe essays written by ryonosuke akutagawa it somebody has outspoken as him like by the time he died he had oh, around 150 stories in publication and so many others probably in works yeah and um when you read some of his stories all of his anxieties like he was extremely afraid of going insane like his mother did and oh, right. that kind of yeah. drove him to do what he did with his life specifically how he ended it but i didn't see a lot of conversation about that coming from mm-hmm. others about him maybe that could be other japanese people being polite about a legend but mm-hmm. people do gossip about the other authors so my my guess is if agutagawa was going around doing mm-hmm. some of these things other people would have written something about it that uh, bad shit crazy is behaving like bad shit crazy something of that sort but yeah. we don't see that meaning everything about his uh, day to day life probably was very very normal before it turned into what it did so his writing is where you can see all of these anxieties kind of reflect themselves and one of the main reasons why uh yukio mishima is the author that kind of sucked me into this particular phenomenon where uh, you read the story and then you go like a gossipy auntie and look up the life of the author and you're like who oh, was he writing about this from his life like is this what this was about in the story and then you're like oh my god yes yes it was mm-hmm. so the directness of it all i think because there was i i not japanese don't live in japan so maybe i'm speaking out of terms But from everything that i've observed as you say unless you are inside and it takes a lot of effort to get inside they are not going to be open with you and i understand why that is the case given what i've read about their history so yeah the, is- the i think i think one important point and i think maya would agree with me mm-hmm. in japan they can be indirect but mm-hmm. the pressure is on the listener here to decipher what's being said and that knowledge of you know the high context culture mm. often gives you a pretty good hint of what was said what was intended what mm. the intended not always sometimes there's leeway mm. but so i how would i say in my country for example when communication occurs if the listener didn't understand then it's the sender's fault In Japan I think there's a bigger burden on the listener to yes. correctly interpret what's being said because 
of the language structure and the communication patterns, right? Oh, yeah. So that's part of the equation. So while it's ambiguous, if, uh, taking the words at face value, based on what wasn't said, it's not that ambiguous. There's an act too going on, mm. yeah. if that makes sense, right? Yeah. And I somehow don't see that in the books. I, I maybe this is which uh, is interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. I don't see it in the books. Like uh, one of the modern books that I've loved is uh, Chitoran, a Breast mm -hmm. and Eggs by Meiko Kawakami, and she has made commentary on the fact that in vitro fertilization for single women is not an option in Japan, and uh, mm. women have to resort to unconventional techniques mm -hmm. to have a baby when they're not dating somebody or married to somebody and mm -hmm. uh, i know a few people in that situation yes I, I i you know i looked i looked it up because i could not believe it japan is supposed to be a developed country i just assumed that ivf was available because we have ivf available in india with our right. conservative culture and everything for single women as well People will look at you with like eyes, but the government won't stop you from making that choice. So it right. was very shocking to read that book. And she does a lot of subtle things with the Osaka and the Tokyo dialect, the sister right. who mm. lives in the city and the sister who lives in the town and all of that. She does that subtly. But largely speaking, she does not put seafood around the elephant in the room which is mm -hmm. talking about how hard it is for people to still make fundamental rights about their bodies. Mm -hmm. And she uses the entire fictional narrative to get through. It was done so brilliantly and like genuinely so directly, but oh. uh, not directly in a way that it slaps you. If we take yeah. a book mm -hmm. from the Americas, which is uh, Great Gatsby, Gatsby kind of spits in the face of the big American dream with his yeah, book. Yeah. But yeah. Fitzgerald yeah. doesn't slap you with that. He is so sneaky about that yeah. going on, and yet he's not indirect about it. So um, something very, very similar was pulled off by uh, Miyako Kawakami. And, you know, it's uh, not just a phenomenon, I think, for newer authors. I think. It's, it's been a trend that authors have been following that we have to be careful about communication in real life. I don't know how true that is, but it seems to be the case. People put too much pressure on themselves about the words. It seems like that. And yeah. we are not going to do that while we write our books or mm -hmm. while we create our media because something similar is observed in manga. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I haven't read a lot of uh, books from Japanese uh, by Japanese authors either, because uh, many reasons. Uh, for me, reading Japanese takes longer than reading English, or uh, reading any of you know the uh, I mean uh, whatever. So, but uh, the thing is that uh, the one book which I actually started reading and finished in the very beginning when I came here and I was still learning Japanese was uh, the book um, Ram Melos. In Japanese it is Hashire Melos. Okay. And uh, it is a book about uh, a young guy, you know, who who is trying to save um, his uh, friend's life. And it was for me, because I was still very new to the Japanese culture at that time, and that, you know, the narrative is about the person, you know, how, how he actually perceives himself about his inner life and everything, his friend's life and so on. And it was just so difficult for me because uh, it was both very direct and indirect at the same time. I had difficulty once again understanding who, you know, the subject of the sentences of this or the subject of the protagonist was, first of all, because of the Japanese grammar, of course, you know, and yeah. I mean, back home in my native language, we always know who is the doer, right? We have all yeah. the grammatical codes, you know, and um, uh, conjugations and so on to, 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 to let you know. Uh, and as Tim said, there is no mistake there, but with the Japanese, it was so unbelievably difficult for me. And I was like, how can, you know, how can I ever live in this country? Because I don't understand people 
are saying, yeah. you know. And, uh, yeah, it's a language uh, element here because Gujarati, which is the language I speak, right. has very similar grammar structure to Japanese. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have this problem that you mentioned ever because. Nice, interesting. But, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I never thought I. Ne this is fascinating because you never really know that you possess a superpower <laughs> till someone says something. You're like, mm, this is why. I didn't short circuit the way I was supposed to because everyone keeps mentioning the mm -hmm. grammar is very, very trippy. And I was like, why am I not tripping? I used to have such a massive complex about that. Like, I am so smart because <laughs> of the language right. that I have as my lingua franca. Which is oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Hey, I, wanted to, I wanted to touch on what this Maya you, you used an expression, I, and I like it. You know, I agree with it. You said directly indirect or both direct and indirect, right? And to, to people who don't live in Japan or don't understand Japanese culture, it's kind of a like, what, what? I, I'm, are you playing both sides of the fence? Like, how is that possible? And yet those of us who are in it, see it. Like I see it. Now, this quick story, like I see it a lot, even at home, right? So I was having dinner with my mother-in-law and my wife and my mother-in-law had just finished going through old photo albums and she there was a picture of me that she pulled out you know when my we were getting married and she said in japanese tim you used to be really handsome <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, and kurumi and i my wife and i we just burst out laughing right and i so of course i'd be in the smart ass american i said oh used to I, are you saying i'm not handsome anymore and she just looks at me and she goes mm. and says nothing okay that is directly indirect that example of her communication style it was very clear what she was saying to me but she didn't say it <laughs> yes yes so no, I, so that I, stuff I, is baked in everywhere like you know so mm -hmm. yes yes yeah, it's it's really yeah, for the record. I was never handsome, okay. But I, I'm just telling you what my mother-in-law said. But okay, oh, back you, to the subject. Yeah. You should uh, show that picture to us and let us judge. You know. <laughs> okay. Yes, we yeah. should do that thing that Mark Zuckerberg did, which led to the invention of Facebook, which is hot or not. Mm. Okay. We will create the photos, right? And then maybe we could create, uh, which is uh, such a random tangent. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's it. We can we can maybe call this uh, indirect directness, which yeah. uh, if you know, you know. If you don't, well, good luck to you. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think that's it, right? Uh, Pachinko, a book fr from Korea, it's getting yes. very popular because Netflix has made a show now. And the show is a, apparently very well made. I haven't seen it yet, but I've read Pachinko, the book. Books. And for many people that is exactly what is happening they're like why are they taking stuff so 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 uh the way that they are because i will end up spoiling the book and i don't want to do that so i'm being very careful uh, it's it's pre it's precisely what we experience with japanese books as well it is indirectly direct if you get it you get it it's like the secret language that is spoken in a family Right. Mm -hmm. If you know what the secret language represents, you're having the time of your life. If you are an outsider, you'll just like keep yeah. looking at your watch. Like, when is it getting over? When is it getting over? That type of thing. So yeah. mm, that, that 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 interesting. Like, this is why I love talking to both of you. Every single time, I think I have enough perspectives on a topic, and then you are like, no, here, take a few more. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, what is what you mentioned about uh, direct directness? Uh, so there is there is actually uh, an author who is Japanese, uh, but he grew up in the, uh, in the United Kingdom. And so uh, several years ago, he was actually he got, I think, the the Nobel Prize for Literature. That's Kazuo Ishiguro. I was like, you're probably talking about Ishiguro, but I was waiting. I am, yes. And I love his books, especially, uh, you know, a couple of them. One of them, which really, really just uh, haunted me for 
months after I wrote it is Never Let Me Go. Oh and my uh, God. I yeah, agree. it's just, and once again, because of this indirect, you know, um, so he, he describes the life of those people in the book, right? And how they gradually leave the community and you never got the direct explanation of what that happens until the very end. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he grew up in the United Kingdom, but his Japanese genes and maybe the family, you know, his uh, Japanese parents actually got him to, to the point where he was so, he's so skillful actually of, of uh, um, what's that conveying all that, you know, the, the, it's not the tension, but that desperation of, mm. you know, and also acceptance of what is happening I to, to the characters. If I were to reword it slightly, mm -hmm. to show multiple emotions with one sentence. Mm -hmm. I think this is what Japanese authors do very well. Uh, you can get whatever emotion you are picking up out of one sentence mm -hmm. depending on when you are reading the book and uh, I, I i think uh, the economy of thought it's like uh, like yeah. a lot of is communicated in very few words and i mean it's, i guess it's not surprising because they got the haiku tradition where they limit the you yes. know the number of syllables and so i like that's kind of baked in as well don't you think Mm -hmm. yeah, I think brevity is a skill. It is it, you can be descriptive. It's very easy to be descriptive. You just yeah. let your mouth and your brain connect and just is associate. You can be descriptive. It's very yeah. easy to be a communicator when you are descriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is so hard to do that when you are limited. But this is why something I tell my authors when they are facing blocks. It depends on what block they are facing. But I force them to put constraints on themselves and somehow mm -hmm. the block goes away. Because when you allow your brain to roam free, it roams free. It's not a bad thing all the time. But right. brevity, sometimes, yeah. Right. Sometimes when you are trying to convey something very, very specific, and I think this is where the rigorous Japanese way of life helps them. Right. Oh, Maya and I have talked about this because we were talking about the idea that once you create constraints, people get more creative. Yeah. And and Japan, Japanese culture tends to have a lot of constraints. I absolutely and they agree. are so brilliant at coming up with these novel. I'm just talking about like in my world where I work manufacturing, they come up with these super simple, elegant solutions, high impact, low cost, and they kept it within this tight box mm. of constraints. That yes. requires immense creativity, but I, I kind of I went off agree. track. Yeah. I, I think yeah. with a lot of these things, uh, constraint-based creativity specifically, I think it takes time to mature. And because yes. of the life, life cycle of products and uh, service markets and all of this, many times these solutions don't really get time to mature, right. which is why we don't right. really see their brilliance play out on the yeah. big world stage. But yeah. if you really look at it, yeah, there's a reason why Japanese industries are unshakable in certain mm -hmm. places, even though Chinese counterfeit products are coming in to offer replacements. People are like, yeah, we cannot do away with this because mm -hmm. if this falters, the rest of my thing also falters. So yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the that has to be the culture that right. uh, from what I speculate again, don't know. Uh, another thing, I think you'll find this interesting. One of this one of the six points that I found uh, is about plot and process. Right, books are equally plot as well as process uh, oriented and in non-Japanese books you will see the question why answered in the book whereas in mm -hmm. Japanese books you will see the question how answered like yeah that makes sense you have read process oriented <laughs> and why is the author author trying to say something or why is it this thing that the author is saying this is what you will get from non-japanese books 
and then russian literature and japanese literature is like no we will answer the how uh, uh so, yeah, yeah they, interesting fascinating russian russian literature too yeah i from uh, what i i have read so far i mean i'm still a noob there i've not yeah. uh, got enough into it because i have to still rely on translators to read in russian i cannot just right read it. Yeah. But in the workplace, the focus is on the how more than the why, based mm -hmm. on my experience in a Japanese workplace. Yeah. So the method the is same, like the same, the same in books as well. They are focused yeah. on how. Like take Keigo yeah. Higashino's Devotion of Suspect X, which is a very incredible. I think you might you both might enjoy reading this book. Um the murder happens, you know who's done the murder. Galileo, this is a series, Detective Galileo. Uh, he investigates things like that. Uh, he also knows who's done the murder, but he doesn't know how the murder happened. And the uh, entire yeah. book is him figuring out how did this person get murdered? Because it is so mind boggling. It is so obvious. And yet you're like, you start doubting yourself, right? Because yeah. <laughs> it can't be that simple. Right? It can't be that complicated. Yeah. It's it's such a brilliant way of no. uh, using the how something mm. is done, like not who done it. You know who's done it. It's a how done it, which is I think fascinating. It is right. fascinating. <laughs> so I think it directly links into the direct indirectness of what they focus on with their books. And I think what they focus on is how. Because as a culture, I think maybe because of, which is another point, uh, geography. I think the geography of Japan kind of affects the narrative a lot. No matter what book you are reading, because uh, I'm not just talking about descriptions. I think the geography of the place where Japan is small and right. uh, and mountainous. Big. So there's a, there were a lot of separate little localization. Yeah. Living, right. Yes. And uh, there's so many disasters happening because they're literally yeah. on the ring of fire. Entirety of Japan is on the ring of fire. They the are. Yes. And mm. uh, I think it's humid as hell. So you have pestilence also doing its thing. Right. So I, I think the geography of the place, it's beautiful. Yes, it is beautiful. But it's, I think, in, in many ways, when you don't have the comforts of modern life, so to speak, it's mm -hmm. hard to think about everyday survival. And oh, yeah. I think it shows in the work that has come out that People have dealt with so much real world problems. They're like, oh, your heart is broken. Wah, wah. Big deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I think. Uh, right, right. No, no. I, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, there's this uh, common theme about Japan is the Japanese being risk averse. And some people, that's out of vogue now. We're supposed to say uncertainty avoidance, I guess, because it has more syllables and it sounds smarter. Yes, I think they're the that. same. I think they're the same thing, but because you can't really avoid uncertainty. That's like a given. Life is not, it's there. And I feel yeah. like the Japanese look at the world and they go, okay, we know where the risk is. So within our own control, let's try to minimize the risk when we can, because we can't, yeah. we can't control yeah. the hurricanes, the earthquakes, the, you know, the landslides, the tsunamis, but we can focus on this. And I think some of that, maybe that comes from, that reality possibly i i absolutely agree 100 percent because i think history geography these things we don't really look at them as serious things but they're difficult to overcome right you cannot right. overcome where you come from you cannot overcome the line that you descend from it's we can avoid it there's definite uh, possibilities of you avoiding it but you can't escape it. At some point, it's going to catch up. Right? It yeah. is. And uh, yeah. it's not something that, oh, yeah, uh, I'm seeing one wonderful book recommended, and there's a comment by Deborah Ann as well. Kobo Abe's Women in the Duels. I love that book. 
because Kobo Abe's uh, writing, very negative, like very post bomb Japan writing, mm -hmm. and very necessary writing, in my opinion. But uh, that's the thing, right? Like, uh, why does something of this sort come in an author's head? That is what uh, fascinates me about a lot of the narratives that are at play. So, yeah, I think geography, history, very difficult to overcome. Uh, are you going to be reading the comment, the big one, Maya? Yeah, well, That's first we got to take a quick break for our wonderful sponsor. Please. Yes. Yes. So go ahead, Maya. Oh, uh, uh, what? Okay, thank you. Another big thank you, and it's a real shout out to Hannah. Hano Rushizawa Hawo and Hause Inc. Hause Inc. is also a company that works in the field of real estate and uh, it offers customized services uh, in home design, construction and uh, renovation, also commercial building construction. Once again, bilingual services. So if you are not really confident in your Japanese, reach out to Hana and talk with her in English. So she will make sure that uh, your needs and your questions are answered so that uh, you can go forward with your project. So it is once again, Hause Inc. and Hana Roshizawa Howell. Hana's uh, contact details are in the description of the video on YouTube and you can always reach out to her on uh, LinkedIn as well. So please do, if you have such a project in mind, and work with Hana and Hause Inc. Yes, so, and Binati, once again, thank you very much for bringing our attention to the uh, comment of uh, Deborah. So Deborah writes, I had to learn about communicating in Japanese in Japan because I worked in theater. I directed plays that win awards and appeared as an actress in plays that win awards as well. And I worked I am working in that way, oh no, and working in that way enabled my ability to read the meaning of many situations. Mm -hmm. So it is yeah, fascinating. Nothing like experience. Experience is so One important. fascinating thing I found about Japanese theater is where they laugh at things. Right? They, like we laugh at the punchline. I, 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 with Japanese humor, I don't see that. Like, First of all, the concept of the punchline, they, they go more slapstick from what I've seen. So I, I totally get what she's alluding to with the theater thing. Because but it's it's slapstick in the more popular sense. But if you go back and you look at Rakugo, like I in college, I studied Japanese comic storytelling. The mm -hmm. process of telling the story is the fun part. And the thing is, everybody knows what the final punchline is anyway, because they, I'm talking about the, exactly. the classic stories, right? Yeah. And they want to enjoy the ride mm. to get to the punchline. They already know, unless it's the first time they saw it, right? Yeah. Um, so I see the process orientation there. And I know Deborah was involved in things like Boondaku. And so that's old, you know, more traditional you know, and, and what's uh, what was the intermission at Bunaku Maya? Refresh, I can't think of the word. Um, uh, Deborah, okay. jump in and tell me. It's a comic relief part of the show, that, right? Um, yeah. I forgot what it is, but I'm I've sure she'll let us know. Uh, I have no clue. But maybe if they start yeah, streaming these shows online, I, I'm, I'm hoping some of yeah. this authentic content finds its way. But there's stuff on TV now, the slapstick, and the and my wife doesn't get it. She looks at these shows and she thinks they're silly. Of course, she was in America for 30 years, so I'm sure that has something to do with it. Um, so even I'm seeing generational differences as well. Yeah. In, in, in I, I, I would not know about that at all. But uh, I, I particularly, one thing I find very fascinating is the presence of the himbo character, like the handsome, stupid male character. And yeah. it's always there. And I'm like, I always wonder why that is. I know they are there to provide comic relief. But why always? Kyogen. Kyogen. I just remember. It's Kyogen. 
Okay. Show Ken is the name of the, yeah, it was a comic relief in Boondock. Okay. Uh, not Boondock, uh, what, what is it? No, I'm sorry, no. No, okay. I'm joking. No. Okay, go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, please, it's fine. I, the more you get to learn, because this is localization knowledge. This you can't read on Google. This you have to talk to people who live in places. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So coming back to what we were talking about, uh, the geography definitely affects, which leads me to another observation, which is Japanese literature, not so much right now, but at least the one that the the, the older kind used to be reactive. It always used to respond to something. Whether mm -hmm. it was fear of technology or fear of, uh, uh, not fear, uh, anxiety around uh, massive number of changes that happened, be it uh, change, changes with the image era or if you go way, 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 way back to the first novel ever written in human history, Genji no Monogatari. And yeah. even, even yeah. that, it, it is responding to something. It is yeah. responding to, I think, uh, the many, many shades of love that people experience and yet everybody is unhappy. So uh, I, I, I find that to be fascinating in older Japanese literature. Now it's way, way diverse. But the older yeah. literature, I think it was very responsive. And I, I do feel that sometimes they are responding to, uh, in some instances, Chinese literature, in another instances, Western literature. And uh, I don't know why was this envy, was this uh, uh, wanting to emulate what you have been inspired by. I don't know why, but it does seem very responsive to me, uh, mm. reactive to me. So, yeah. what are your takes um, on it? Yeah, I was, years ago when I was in college, I was studying Rakugo. I uh, study. I was trying to study the roots of Rakugo, right? And I found this book. It was an anthology, and the chapter in it was by a academic named Barbara Roosh. And it was Japan, Japan in the Muromachi Age. And then the subtitle was "The Making of a National Literature." Okay, mm. and her thesis was. These traveling jonglers, these storytellers, many of them Buddhist priests, were spreading the word to the illiterate masses in Japan because until then the elite were practitioners of Buddhism, but now they were spreading it, right? And they were telling these, these vo the vocal arts, she called it the cinemization of Japanese literature. So people could access these stories, right? <laughs> And during the, the Sengoku Jidai, the Muromachi period, they're traveling all over, spreading the word. And according to Barbara Roosh, all the themes, the general themes that were created in that period oh. fed into all the literature in Japan that ensued. Now, again, modern literature, I, it I agree with so you. Much sense, then. It's getting more diverse. So if you ever get a chat, just Japan and the Muromachi age, Barbara Roosh, right? And you know, the making of a national literature if you google okay. it you can find it. it's it's not that long but it was very informative to me in i will definitely check it out because when you were speaking of this no i was reminded of something that kind of links to india as well uh, ravindranath tagore is a very very popular uh, writer from india and uh, he's bengali and his work has been uh, internationally acknowledged and he refused. He refused to write in any other language but his own. So Yasunari Kawabata, he used to write in English. Because, uh, not all the time, but I think based on what you mentioned, I, I think maybe he was taught something. And that is what he used to stick to. And then yeah. he talked to Chagor. And... From, then day, from that day on, he started uh, talk to Tagore or read about Tagore. I am not sure about that. From that day on, he started writing in Japanese. And uh, I think there's something very, very fascinating about this. Because when you've been taught to toe the line, which I think is the case with the culture, toe the line, do the thing mm -hmm. that you have to do, and write a fancy little poem about it or do a flower arrangement. 
something right. of this sort, and then go to sleep. Uh, when you have been taught that, and then you see somebody do something very, very against that, you're like, oh, he did the thing that we are not supposed to do, and nothing happened. In fact, he won a Nobel Prize. That could be me. Why <laughs> he can write be in Bengali and mm. win prize? Why can't I write in Japanese and do the same? And he's Kawabuta does the Kawa Yasunari Kawabuta does get a Nobel Prize. I forget which book. I which book got him the Nobel? Was it the Izu one or was it the uh, Shimamura one? I mm. I forget which book specifically won the Nobel. One of his books did, and it is in Japanese. And yeah. I I think yeah. this you mentioned. I'll definitely check this book out. Please tell me the name again because I forgot. The the uh, name of the 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 Rakugo reference you gave me. Oh, it, I, actually, it wasn't Rakugo. So the book is an anthology, Japan in the Muromachi Age. Okay. And there's many authors, right? So there's one chapter. Um, midi the, the chapter is titled Medieval Jongleurs, and mm. I, don't know if I, I'm, I know that's a French word, I'm probably not saying it right, and The Making of a National Literature. Mm. That's the title of that chapter. So mm -hmm. it, was, it puts so much into perspective, and everybody says that Lakugo started in the Edo period. Nothing just starts. There's no. always, it's always evolving from something. So. It has Buddhism roots, and it comes from these sermons that these these that these priests would teach. But they did it in an entertaining way, so they can engage the common folks yeah. and tell and 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 make their point through storytelling. But a lot of it, they used humor and other techniques, and a lot of them use visuals. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of Japanese. Again, I like her word, the cinemization of Japanese storytelling, because mm -hmm. it wasn't. So Rakugo, it's gestures, and you still got a fan as your prop, and you got a towel, and you can use it in different creative ways. But there were other ways where they used picture books. You know, I mean, there was there's a, a very rich vocal tradition, but again, yeah. that fed into Japanese literature. And there's these like general, large, arching themes that you can still see, at least back in the '80s until modern day. You know, I don't know if I'm sure some of it. It's not going to go away. It's there. Yeah, exactly. It's you, are, you are inspired by those who come before you, right? You build on their Yeah. Work. Yeah. And you have to see where it comes from. You don't have to. Most people don't. Like, even in their own culture, you don't know where a lot of your thinking came from or your assumptions. Yeah. But if you study your own culture, then you yeah. start understanding, oh my gosh, this is just my culture. It's not necessarily other cultures think this way. Like, you know, that's the tadpole turning into a frog and jumping out of the pond and then going back. Now they know the difference between yeah. water and, and air and dry land, you know. that's That that was my theme in coming to Japan. I was a tadpole when I got here, you know, so. But I think that's the power of books, right? Um, books yes. are very, very permanent, unlike social media posts. And... Whether a book is good or not, I mean, I, I try to restrain myself from saying that this book is great, this book uh, is bad, things of the sort. Because I think every book serves a purpose. Whoever mm. wrote the book, for them, whatever yeah. is in the book, it's important. It can be the worst thing you have ever read. Yeah. But yeah. it is important for this one person who took the time, put in the effort to compile whatever this is. And if you are a proactive reader, you are going to find the value in that book. I mean, it's going to be hard for certain books. But if you if you really, really, really put in the effort, there's no such thing as bad books. I, I like to yeah. live with that delusional thought. Oh, yeah. And it always depends on the, you know, the, the stage of life the reader is at and also their environment, what they're looking for. Because yeah. at some point, I can also say that, uh, you know, when I was a teenager and try, I tried to read some books, I just couldn't mm -hmm. continue. And then 20 years later, when I tried to read them, I finished them, you know, uh, almost in 24 hours, right, yeah. each one. So yeah. it's also about 
your preparedness, how ready you are to read that particular book. And it's, yeah. again, experience in what you're looking for. So, uh, as you say, you know, we, it's very difficult to say that a book, a book is great or a book is bad b because of that. It also depends on the reader's condition at the time of reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the more general theme that we've talked about before is the power of storytelling. Okay. Yeah. And so as in college, I had to read these dry academic anthropology books, which mm -hmm. talk about people almost like they're specimens mm -hmm. and it, rather than human beings, but the storytelling that mm -hmm. conveys these same concepts are much more powerful because people, first of all, they're engaged, they relate to them and it sticks. If mm -hmm. it's wrapped in a, in a well-told story, you learn something deeply about the culture. And I think literature, is kind of a mm. shortcut. It is. It's a short, it's a better option than those dry anthropology books that I hate. And that was yeah. my field. <laughs> so. No, I, I, I think uh, we can, we, and we should talk about her. We should talk about uh, Murasaki Shikibu because a uh, very good example, Genji no Monogatari and Shikibu Niki, which mm -hmm. is uh, Tales of Genji, the fictional account and mm -hmm. Diary of Lady Murasaki, which is like a journal. A lot right. of it is lost, but the one that still survives to this date is like, because we, Murasaki Shikibu is a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. She was right. born to the Fujiwara family. That's right. not her right. name. The right. author is writing because I, I, I do believe that, I, I don't know how true this is, but while I was learning the Japanese alphabet, like years ago, this is how what I was taught, right? Hiragana uh, from Wikipedia of all places. Hiragana is curly because everybody uses Hiragana. Mm -hmm. Katakana is angular because only men use Katakana because Katakana employs foreign words. Women don't have to interact with foreigners. Oh, so old school, so yeah. <laughs> And uh, because kanji was repurposed uh, Chinese characters, uh, women yeah. were generally not allowed to use it. And I was like, what? Mm. Alphabet means sexism. This was <laughs> very yeah. revolutionary to me. So yeah. I, I, I think the fact that uh, the first, like the first piece of writing that exists ever comes from this priestess called Enidwana. And basically she, she invokes Inanna who is a goddess and she's like, Inanna, curse all of them bitches. That's basically <laughs> the first known writing. No, okay. <laughs> then you have something like... Uh, Genji no Monogatari, which is the first known novel format uh, that we know of so far. Mm -hmm. Right. And it is a female writer using the female gaze to tell us the story of uh, Hikaru Genji in like 54 chapters uh, to showcase shades of love, to showcase what is now very, very popular on LinkedIn as Mono no Aware. Everybody has oh. written a post on Mono no Aware. I'm like, oh, stop it, guys. I know. Stop I know. Like, I know. Japanese philosophy. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. I agree. And, I agree. Uh, yeah, Mono no Aware. The fact that without having knowledge of plot and structure and characterization and all of this, uh, and if we do critically analyze Genji no Monogatari with all the literature knowledge we have now, it seems like the book doesn't have structure. But it does have so much structure and it says mm. so much without being very, very direct about it. Because I think it has like 800 Vaka poems within the narrative. To have 800 poems, one plot where this prince who was born to a concubine, therefore making him slightly illegitimate, uh, goes around uh, finding the perfect woman for him who resembles his mother. This is such such layered onion to have as the plot. Then he yeah. finds a 10 year old which he kidnaps and turns into his wife who he repeatedly cheats on. And oh. everybody is miserable. 
this is this is the plot right this is roughly the plot and you are like if you just listen to that it's like why is this lady gushing about this book however when you sit down and read the story it mm-hmm. makes so much sense why this book is revered and why this book led to like an entire subgenre of literature being created which yeah. i would argue is the most popular genre of literature in existence the novel yeah. the, the novel, novel. Mm-hmm. And, and the and novel she did, that. she did that by being observant because what we do know is she was in the court mm-hmm. and uh, she was put she she used to write poetry uh the mm-hmm. the kind that i think japanese noble women were expected to write back in the mm-hmm. day and uh, instead of just doing that she was observing things and she was cataloging them what remains of her journal is how we know this and then mm-hmm. instead of uh, doing what everybody else was probably doing which is gossiping about it and going about their business she layered it into a fiction story and that's how right. we know how things are during the hen hen is the is is, it, is that how it's the he okay yes hey yeah yeah the, the because we are specifically told about how hikaru smells amazing again and yeah. again and again and right. you're like why is this mentioned so many times why is the author mentioning the smell of one character again and again and again and again it tells you something right it tells you people during that time probably to use perfume very small yeah, thing yeah yeah interesting But yeah yeah the novel gives you so many insights of the sort and uh, the different forms of love that are on display and oh, i wow. i don't i mean i mean hikaru is what we young ends like to call a fuck boy right and a uh, ve- very crude way of putting it but that was normalized having concubines as royalty was normalized and yeah. it didn't really have a stigma associated to it but yeah. he was miserable you assume that you you soak into the finer parts of life uh, all the time like you do because he he does do drugs and um, he has all the perfume and all the ladies and he is smart he writes very good poetry he's also strong he has all he checks all the boxes of the conventional stereotypical hero he should be happy but he isn't he has mm. everything that most of us assume under material comforts to be happiness he mm. has it all he's not happy because i think she, the author is making a commentary on uh, the i suppose attachment detachment philosophy that we see in buddhism all right we always have attachment mm. and no matter how hard we try unless we get detachment there's no happiness when you are obsessively looking for love which is what hikaru does till he mm. find Murasaki not Murasaki the author Murasaki the 10 year old girl that he kidnaps and turns into his wife mm-hmm. no problem but yeah. i mean okay we are we should not judge history with the morality of the present uh, yeah. so we let that go um, he still does not experience joy and happiness right right and right comfort and peace and those are age old themes if you think about it you know exactly and, and the fact that she compressed all of this and invented like mono no aware which is uh, brilliant she did it without the internet she did it when so yeah. many people was probably policed from her because of her gender and yeah. it's it's done so so well that you have some rando in india obsessing over <laughs> It. Yeah. Oh, and I, you, you mentioned you mentioned gender, and be, earlier you mentioned observant, and it was funny when you mentioned that a light bulb went on because I was thinking, mm-hmm. is it a coincidence that the first novel ever was written by a woman? And I think you can I make an argument. I think mm-hmm. you can make an argument that the situation they were put in yeah. forced them to behave a certain way, and one was. 
don't talk unless spoken to and observe. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got this situation where a woman is observing what she's seeing and she has the creativity and the talent to put it into words and -hmm. write this novel. I like it. I'm saying, should we be surprised that it's a woman or is it just a coincidence, a flip of a coin? I I think it comes back to that thing we talk about with constraints. She could not use the conventional ways to present her point of view in court. So Mm -hmm. what she did is she literally invented a literature genre. Within her constraints. Yeah. This is oh, new. Yeah. They won't be sure. able to put me in jail because I did something new. And that's what right. happened actually. If you if you trace uh, uh, the, I suppose, uh, way some of the books are talked about uh, before uh, the whole Japan versus China thing happened. I think Japan was everything related to the royalty. In Japan was very, very influenced by Chinese heavily, people. actively. Yeah, and they didn't used to see it as an insult to be compared to China, which has become right, the case right. Now. But it wasn't the case back then. So yeah. back then it would have been called cultural appropriation, but we won't we won't go into that can of worms. But go ahead. And I, by the way, I'm all I, for it. I think it I raised. Get all all three of us canceled. <laughs> yeah, we won't we won't go there. But but it did literally it raised Japan's level of culture in a very short period of time. Confucianism, yeah. Buddhism, kanji, which was trickling in anyway. So Shoto Taishi. Because Shoto, because uh, yeah. because of the trade thing, and access to the Silk Road. They got yeah. culture in brief, a like culture from all over the world yes. was trickling down to them from those ships. It's yeah. I, 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 if I were to put myself in their shoes, it makes sense why they were influenced and impressed by what they yeah. saw because it's got to be amazing. You don't have any, you live in a forest and then somebody yeah. gives you a laptop with a Netflix password. You're going yeah. to lose your mind. Because yeah. there's so much content there. There's so many stories, so many perspectives, mm-hmm. uh, things of the sort, uh, which also kind of reminds me why, once again, why Murasaki Shikibu was awesome. Because uh, till this point of time, we only had myths and legends. And mm. uh, right. uh, those um, kind good of point. things. Yeah. yeah. And here, this woman is like, screw that. I will make a character, not a god, not a king, not a queen, a prince who is right. going to some like subject selection. The mm. art of what she would have put in for subject selection and to have brought in the plot. It's brilliant. The fact that I, I love your point. It it is worth noting that it was a woman who wrote the first novel. Yeah. 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 I'm, yeah. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to look it and, up. And, and, and I, I, I would tell you, I've worked with a lot of men and women in my career. And I will just mm-hmm. tell you, my experience, it's anecdotal. Mm-hmm. Overall, women were much better communicators and collaborators than men. And I that both Americans and Japanese, in yeah. my experience. I'm not saying it's true for everybody. but oh, So yeah. it makes sense to me, the communication oh, side of it. Mm. But you cannot help it, actually, because throughout the evolution of the humankind, women have always stayed back, right? They have stayed around the, the fire and, uh, you know. Yeah, the fruit picking <laughs> and uh, yes. gathering and, yeah, yeah. And, and everything. So, I mean, it's not sexist to say that, yeah, women have had to, to be better communication uh, communicators. Um, yeah. So... But it's it's great. I mean, it still remains, right? It started uh, maybe many years back. We have to be more collaborative, and um, I, I shouldn't say we because I, we don't know what it was like for women back in the day. Right, 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 right. We yeah. Absolutely, don't know what it was like because, um, and we can maybe talk about uh, one. Like, it's not a book; it's a show based on a book. One of the main reasons why I loved Shogun, it's uh, the whole that whole scene 
where Mariko talks to her husband mm -hmm. with like this camellia flower in the background. I was like, oh my God, this is so brilliant. Because I, I, I believe uh, there's juxtaposition done uh, before that camellia, when it falls, it's like a head being chopped off. Mm -hmm. So people don't really present camellia flowers. And Mariko had a full-on like arrangement while she was drinking tea with her abusive husband, which is basically such an indirectly direct way of saying, I hope you die. And I I I couldn't get over the fact that she is communicating without communicating. And then I started yeah. looking for some of these signs, right? In some of the books, after watching that particular scene, because I'm like, I'm sure this exists. And sure enough, I found it in uh, in uh, Yuki Guni, Snow Country, oh, by uh, Yasunari yeah. Kawabata. The way yeah. he rejects the concubine is, he doesn't say, you're too old for me now. He just calls her woman instead of girl. And he walks away. Yeah. yeah. So, it, yeah, yeah. Some, I, some of these communication patterns, I think some of these communication patterns are very, very cultural. And yes. whether we like to admit it or not, given the modern moralities we find ourselves in, there is a gender com component to it. There is a class component to it. Yeah. And it is going to rear its beautiful and ugly head, depending yeah. on how you see it. Yeah. So, I, it's yeah, you know, it's so funny because there's this cliche that for, for example, a Japanese man, he won't say, will you marry me in his proposal? What does he say, My, I forget what the cliche is, but it's like, I want you to make me so shiro for me in the morning, which of course is very sexist, but it's something like that, right? And and then I, I remember in college, the hardest course I ever took was Japanese literature in Japanese. And our teacher was Japanese. And we were going over this scene where the husband and the wife have this disagreement and she tells him she's not happy because of the way she arranges her flowers in the gangkan when he comes in they're they're arranged in a non-harmonious way and that's supposed to be the hint that his wife is ticked off and then they have their argument and then afterwards he says make me some tea now according to my japanese professor he goes that's he saying i love you and let's get we're, we're past this now we're, we're, we're moving on now that was his interpretation of it. But the fact that making me tea or making me miso shiru sounds like extremely indirect ways to say something, to get your message. Yeah. And I know we, we it's 9.04, so I apologize for extending this, but no, I just uh, love these conversations. I could do this for a few more I hours. I told you, right? We uh, won't be done. I, yeah. I was going to talk about Natsume Soseki. I was going to talk about Ryonosuke Akutagawa Asuma Dazai, so many. But we derailed you. I'm sorry. We could, but so we got to have you come back again to finish your your, your talk. I always ensure that I have. Now, I, yes. Yes. <laughs> no, uh, I think that uh, well, this is a topic which we can uh, talk, uh, you know, a lot more about, and one hour is not enough, for sure. And uh, I think that yes, uh, when we I had a blast. I had so much fun. So thank you. Yeah, same here. So, I mean, this thing that you told in the end, you know, right. to be written by a woman, it's going to haunt me now. Okay, it's a good theme. Like, it's something. Yeah, it, it would be a good theme for you to explore. I like it. So I, I look forward to your future posts about it. <laughs> no pressure. But still, before we finish, yes, I wanted to say about you know that uh, story, uh, you know, which uh, you were. Japanese teacher interpreted, and you have always talked about uh, Kurumi-san, how she does things about you, uh, for you, right? right. So this, uh, she does things uh, for you. She doesn't tell you I love you, but she does your favorite things. She cooks you your favorite food. She cooks, uh, she brings exactly. a coffee. For you. And this is the way the culture is here. Once again, it's but to not be fair, be fair. Okay. Once in a while, not very often when she's mad at me, Mm -hmm. She starts cleaning and she starts bumping the vacuum cleaner. It's like a very loud cleaning. And I try to, I resist the temptation to say, honey, you're doing a great job because I know she's mad at me, but it's very rare. But that, that's the other way of her displeasure. She doesn't mess with the flower arrangement. 
She goes to the vacuum, bumping it around. But I mean, everybody is evil. Cuts. But I, I will say this: I'm not, I'm not supposed to say this because we're in Japan. But I am uh, extremely lucky to have my wife. I, I can't believe she keeps me around. So I'm very happy that she does. I think so. life would be very, very boring if there's no disagreement. No, you have to. People, yeah. people who say we never fight. First of all, that means one side is just keeping it all in and you're doing yeah. come on, right? You have to, you know, fight. I don't like the word fight, but there's disagreements, right? And there's, yeah. and you work it out. That's how you keep going. You work it out. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, but so. one thing, another thing that I really love uh, here is that uh, people know that there are disagreements. And when, uh, so when you have a disagreement with somebody, the interpretation always goes in the way that you trust that person enough to disagree with them and to show your disagreement. So, because you don't show and your to love them anyway, or to you know, have them as your friend anyway. And, right. Yeah. Yes. So you don't show your disagreement and your indignation to somebody whom you don't trust. Uh, you know, to be able to to talk with you and to talk it yeah. through, right? So, but anyway, we are. Yes, this is. I mean, we're I yes, too we're, much fun. we're having too much fun. That's the problem. <laughs> we are. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so Binati, let's let's continue because uh, you've got uh, the books we we couldn't talk about. Uh, we need uh, still need to talk about them. Okay, so let's do it once again. Continue the the book Japanese books topic, okay. and uh, yes, as soon as uh, your schedule allows, of course. <laughs> yes, right. yes, but thank you so very much for this. Really, thank you, and uh, you know that you are. Yes, definitely one of our favorite speakers here. Oh, and yeah. But don't tell the other speakers, thing. okay? We don't want anyone to get mad. This will be our secret. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Now, the episode that you guys did on nutrition recently, that one was such uh, an eye opener. Like, other oh, nutrition. The, yeah. Oh, yes. Jake's, uh, Jake's story. Jake yes. was awesome. He's great. Yeah. I, I got to have like, money. This is so fascinating. And even the whole explanation about the new prime minister and everything that I was like, I get to listen to this while I make lunch. This is incredible. Oh, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> yes, very much so. All right. So then this is a promise. We'll continue uh, the topic uh, soon. And also we'll probably talk about, um, well, not only other Japanese books, but also 